The Haunted Palace by Edgar Allan Poe Structure, Themes, Summary, Analysis Hello and welcome to the discourse. The very first published work of Edgar Allan Poe was Tamerlane and Other Poems which was first published in 1827. In 1839, Edgar Allan Poe published The Haunted Palace, a poem, in the April 1839 issue of Nathan Brooks' American Museum magazine. In September 1839, Poe added the poem in his short story The Fall of the House of Usher, in which Roderick Usher sings the poem as a song for the narrator. The story of the fall of the House of Usher is about madness, illness and the collapse of buildings and people. And so is the central idea of the haunted palace in which the poet compares a human head with a glorious palace that withstands hard times but gradually dilapidated and suffer depression and eventually deteriorates. Structure of the haunted palace The poem consists of 48 lines designed in 6 stanzas of 8 lines each. Though the rhyming scheme is not persistent, the poem loosely follows the rhyme scheme of ABABCDCD. The poem is an allegory about a king in the olden time long ago, who is afraid of evil forces and th that threaten him and his palace, foreshadowing impending doom. Poe used enjambment, hyperbole, personification, cicera and alliteration in the poem. In the opening part, Poe describes the palace as a beautiful, glorious building and uses assonance to beautify it, yellow, glorious, golden, float and flow. Repetition of vowel sound O. The poem is an early example of imagery and the title itself lets the reader know what the central focus of the poem is, the main image it deals with. The later part of the poem appears to be a contrasting image of the upper part. Poe uses allegory to describe a person's psychology, their inner mental state suffering depression. Themes of the Haunted Palace The poem begins with the theme of happiness and the poet uses words and imagery to offer a sense of immense happiness and prosperity. In the first four stanzas, the poet describes the palace situated in Green Valley where sweet and gentle air continues to flow. The different parts of the palace are described by positive adjectives like radiant, glorious and sparkling. In the first four stanzas, the narrator is describing his bittersweet memories of the palace it used to be. The narrator suggests that the past was a golden age, much better than the darkness and grim misery that followed. The palace was full of good vibes and positive spirits. The theme of supernatural forces is continuous throughout the poem. Poe raises the theme of sadness in the fifth stanza and describes the palace turning desolate, ghastly and hideous. One can easily imagine the state of Roderick Usher's house while reading the fifth stanza. Now the palace is haunted by evil spirits. However, the poet isn't actually talking about a palace, rather he is offering an allegory of a man's descent into depression and madness. The palace head goes from being cheerful, orderly and in tune to being grim, disordered and pretty much just totally out of hack. That's what Roderick Usher went through. Summary of the Haunted Palace Stanza 1 In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch, thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. The poet begins while describing a beautiful grand palace that is governed by thought. The palace is situated in a beautiful green valley. The poet suggests that it is the greenest valley accommodating the good angels. Poe uses enjambment to describe how beautiful and radiant the palace was that stood in the past. Poe then uses personification and says that the palace reared or raised its head up. Poe then personifies thought as a monarch. The palace is in thought's dominion. The poet then describes the majesty of the palace. Seraph is an angel of Christian mythology belonging to the highest order of the ninefold celestial hierarchy associated with light, ardor and purity. The poet uses exaggeration and hyperbole and says that this angel of the highest order never spread its wings, pinion, on a fabric, an old-fashioned word for building, so fair. Stanza 2 Banners yellow, glorious golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the golden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumped and pallid, a winged order went away. 
The poet continues to describe the majestic palace that it used to be in the past and mentions that a long time ago there were always beautiful bright banners in glorious yellow golden colors that used to float and flow in the serene air. Poe uses assonance here with the repeating sound of the vowel O. The poet then reminds the reader that all this beauty was a long time ago. Poe used Cicera using dashes within a line to break it and offer stress. The poet describes a beautiful day a long time ago when the air was sweet and gentle that flew along the ramparts surrounding walls of the palace. These ramparts of the palace were pale and decorated in a way as if they had plumped feathers. Poe indicates the yellow golden banners he mentioned earlier. Stanza 3 Wanderers in that happy valley through the two luminous windows saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law. Round about a thorn we are sitting for Pyrogene. In state his glory well bit fitting. The ruler of the Rhine was seen. The poet continues to describe the beauty and majestic aura of the palace and says that wanderers would often visit the valley to witness the magic of its beauty. They would see through the two glittering windows from outside and observe the dancing spirits that follow the well-tuned law of the lute or the music of that guitar-like musical instrument. There are only two windows into the palace through which one can see inside. The poet then mentions the throne on which the monarch is sitting. He mentions the monarch as Porphyrogene. It is a word that was made by Edgar Allan Poe and it means born in purple. In the past, during the Roman era, purple was a color associated with royalty in ancient Constantinople. Thus, being born in purple means belonging to the aristocracy. The wanderers could see through those two windows the monarch of the realm in all his glory and befitting opulent and magnificent surroundings. He already learned that the monarch is thought. Stanza 4 And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore. A troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king. The poet then describes the door of the palace which is decorated with bright pearls and rubies. The lips are pearl and teeth are ruby. The yellow golden hair are, a, are hair. The only two glittering luminous windows are his eyes. The realm is the whole head of a happy, healthy man whose ruler is thought. Poe offers the metaphorical image of a happy, healthy, thoughtful and sane human being in these four stanzas. Through the door of pearl and ruby of that palace, a troop of echoes comes out and sings in the chorus. In Greek mythology, echo is a nymph who could only repeat the words of others. The poet says that whatever that human head said or whatever words came out of the mouth of that human head were harmonious, sweet and nice to listen to, like a song. The words coming out of the door of that palace praised the wit and wisdom of the ruler, thought. Stanza 5 but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, let us moan, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. Time changes in the fifth stanza and so does the mood and the theme of the poem. The palace, the human head, is no more a happy jolly place. It has been attacked and defeated by evil things, evil spirits. The monarch was defeated and his majestic high estate was attacked by evil spirits that wore robes of sorrow. The poet then mentions the present. All happiness is gone and what remains is agony and sorrow. The poet then calls out the reader to mourn for the defeated, abandoned, desolate monarch who will never see another happy day again. The poet mentions that all opulence, wit and beauty of the palace or human head is a thing of the past now. Stanza 6 And travellers now, within that valley, through the red litten window, see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like ghastly rapid river, through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever, and laugh but smile no more. The travellers still continue to visit the valley, but unlike the old times when the wanderers enjoyed the sight of glittering luminous eyes, the travellers now see dimly red litten eyes. Red eyes symbolize sickness, mental distress, madness, lack of sleep and evil. 
Now the travelers cannot see the beautiful spirits dancing on the law of all lute, rather they see vast forms that moves like fanatics following a discordant, incoherent, inharmonious or lacking any harmony tune. It all seems unreal or out of fantasy. The head is seen no more. The door of the palace is not glittering with ruby and pearl now. It is rather a pale door through which a ghastly rapid river of words often flows out that offers nothing but disaster. The head now laughs like a mad person but smiles no more. It is an image of insanity, endless laughter with no joy in it. The head palace is not able to understand joy or happiness anymore. So this is it for today. We will continue to discuss the history of American English literature. Please stay connected with the discourse. Thanks and regards.